So how does ChatGPT work? And what we're gonna start uh, talking about is the idea of a large language model. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff uh, and you can just let me know as you want me to advance the slides. Will do, thank you, Dan. And thanks everybody. We, we are gonna spend a little bit of time on background. I promise I will try not to bore you all with all the nerdy stuff. I do think it's important though, even as business owners that we understand a little bit where this stuff is coming from. Um, Dan, just an FYI from the chat, I think we've got some artifacts in the video that might be covering the top and bottom of the slides, some gray boxes. Um, so what is ChatGPT? I'll get into that while we're, we're working on those visuals. Thank you guys for the feedback. Um, ChatGPT is a large language model. So what in the world is a large language model? Well, a large language model is a machine that is designed to process, understand, and generate a lot of language. And so you're going to hear a lot of this jargon thrown around when you're looking at different tools. People might say LLMs, or they might say language models or large language models. You might hear people talking about NLP or natural language processing. Fundamentally, all we are talking about is machines that are designed to understand content or to generate content using written human language. Um, the way that we built these tools over the last few years is that we essentially went out and scraped the entire internet of data. Companies like OpenAI, they took every website on the internet and they said, let's build a what, what they call a deep learning machine, a neural network that essentially takes inputs and tries to predict the next word. And so when we started this process, we were really just trying to build basic tools that were used in use cases like chatbots that helped us predict the next word. This is something you could do with your kids, with your friends, a game you could play. In this example here, the second law of robotics, we're essentially taking every chunk of the sentence and trying to get a machine to predict the next word in the sentence. And in this case, the, the I won't go into what this sentence is, but if you did this around the kitchen table, you could probably actually get your friends and family to guess the next thing you were going to say if you gave them the first five or six words. And when we started doing this, we used a process called unsupervised learning, where we essentially just took everything on the internet and said, hey, let's build a language model that predicts the next word. The, the reason this is important is because we did what we called unsupervised learning, we trained these models on everything, correct information, incorrect information, uh, ethical information, biased and horrible information. And so these tools over time became really good at reflecting and, and generating human language and understanding human language, but they also behaved like humans, which meant that they were sometimes wildly inappropriate or sometimes they would say things that didn't make sense. And so there's a second part of this process here that companies like OpenAI and Google are doing called supervised learning through something specifically called reinforcement training. So what's happened now is that we've had these, these machines that are generating information and we're using them and then giving those companies feedback as to which one of these examples is better. In this case, this is actually from a TED talk from OpenAI talking about having the machine write a joke for the presentation. And then we are giving the machine feedback as to which joke we liked better. And ultimately, that helps train this machine almost like a human child you would train to really understand how to interact with the world and generalize some of these concepts. And so one reason I bring this up is the reason why we have things like free access to chat GPT is these companies are really using us to train these AIs to become better, smarter, and more sophisticated in the things that they can do out in the marketplace. Um, so why is this so popular all of a sudden? Uh, this is where the nerd in me gets excited and the CEO in me wants to fall asleep. So I won't spend much time here. But basically, at the end of 2016 and early 2017, a bunch of researchers from Google released something called a transformer. That is the T in chat GPT, which stands for uh, uh, general, generative pre-trained transformer. The transformer was essentially a machine that did all of this stuff we already knew how to do a lot better. It used a lot of graphical processing units and some of our modern machine technology to just accelerate the ability of these machines to do what we had already designed them to do prior to 2017. So because of this tech advancement in the last five years, we have just seen an exponential growth in what these language models are able to do from a functionality standpoint. We can move to the next slide, Dan. Um, so here's where this stuff gets extremely cool and, and a little bit crazy. What's amazing with these large language models is there's a concept in the, the science and engineering community called emerging features or emergence, 
What we did when we built these models is we tried to just create a machine that would predict language. So if you were starting a sentence, help me complete that sentence. Or if we took a sentence and deleted words, can you fill in what those words were? What we started seeing was actually accidental behavior that the engineers did not intend to specifically program. So the first thing we actually saw was that we started building these language models and all of a sudden they could do sentiment analysis. They could figure out exactly whether a review was bad or good. Or in this example, the machine in this case has actually created an internal concept of the periodic table of elements and can answer a very technical scientific question given to the machine. This was not something that was explicitly programmed. As we just trained more and more machines on more data out on the internet, they started to be able to do things that we as a community did not expect from, from an engineering perspective. And this is what's exciting, but is also what's so dangerous. So as these machines have developed, these things have started being able to do things like write code. They've been able to do things like uh, 40 digit arithmetic and things that we would, wouldn't expect from a language model that now we are seeing emerge as features. This is also what makes them dangerous. So where are we right now? It's a gold rush. Every company in the world is desperately trying to produce their own language models. We see Google has them, Microsoft has them, Meta has them, OpenAI, NVIDIA. There's a bunch of different tools. So as you as a business owner start looking at how you can use these tools, I guarantee you, you will find thousands of different options. Part of why we put this course together is to try to help business owners navigate those options and show you how you can use the best ones today. But there's really going to be over the next five years, a continued struggle between some of these large corporations, smaller companies like OpenAI, and even open source communities of developers that are all fighting to get in on this technology. So I think we'll continue to see more and more tools come up, but it's really an exciting place to be from an engineering standpoint. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we talked about the search wars in unit one, and that is uh, really the, the, the truer version of the search war is it's a search melee, it's a free for all. There's just so much going on.